I want I just want to mention a few things that are important uh, in the OER world, uh, and uh, this actually touches upon what uh, Carson already mentioned, uh, and how we uh, are building an infrastructure in order to facilitate uh, addressing those issues uh, of, of importance. So, um, again, I started the present. Is it not working? Okay, uh, I, I mentioned the these five R's of OER, this constitution that that is used in order to define what the uh, what represents a, an OER and what does not, and the ability to retain, reuse, revise, remix, and redistribute. And, and I fundamentally believe that the LibreText project is designed in order to take each of these five R's uh, and amplify them to the greatest capabilities that we can do with modern technology, uh, and that involves. Uh, essentially building a warehouse of infrastructure, of OER, uh, of capabilities in order to really augment uh, the ability to uh, author content, to distribute content, and even a learning platform from students in order to engage with content. We addressed uh, all three of those aspects during the last couple of days. Um, a key aspect uh, that is oftentimes important in order to think about OER, there's OER with the big O and there's OER with a little O. The, open as a paradigm for how we operate uh, is actually fundamentally different from how we were taught to operate and how scholarly activities uh, generally operate in the sense of when we provide or generate material that we want to have openly licensed we're essentially not relegating our ownership of the material but we are providing privileges for the rest of the community in order to use that material subject to what list of privileges that we want them to do. Uh, and and that, that lack of freedom or lack of control conflicts oftentimes with our personal desires to have control over our content. And there's a variety of reasons why we want to control the content. For example, when you are making an essay, uh, you want to have control over what that essay represents because it reflects you with your and your work by your name uh, associated with it. If you distribute it, uh, other people can come in and start to edit and modify it. And you start getting into issues about what's an author and what's a remixer, which again, Carson started out his discussion with, uh, and how to address those issues appropriately. Uh, and, but the key point is that in order to fall into the OER um, infrastructure, you essentially have to blow your mind from how we have dealt with things before in terms of ownership and privileges uh, and, and attributions and bylines in order to uh, envision a more public uh, aspect of that. And again, uh, that conflicts with academic uh, sensibilities. It conflicts very much with publishing sensibilities because publishing is intrinsically a business uh, that is based on limiting access to the content uh, it, or at least throttling that access through uh, a wallet. Uh, and OER has a, an issue in regards to uh, jiving with OER, I'm sorry, publishing has issues with jiving with OER content, as do most business models. It doesn't mean that OER can't be coupled into businesses, um, but you have to be very careful in how you formulate that in order to still preserve the general paradigm of openness in, in OER. Unfortunately, many projects out there still are not fully engaged with the openness in OER, uh, but yet they say that they are in OER. So I, I sometimes refer to them as OER with a little O instead of a big O. Uh, and those are typically people who want to have some control over the content that they have distributed. Uh, so they, they don't want to let people avail themselves to the full permissions off of that. But licensing uh, is complicated in general uh, in OER. And I intentionally avoided the discussion of licensing. And I think it was largely uh, avoided in, in the other sessions of these, uh, this work group. I just want to mention some of the licensing infrastructures that are available for content out there that, that's OER. So the, the creme de la creme of openly licenses is actually not even a license. It's basically public domain, which means that you have full control in order to do whatever you want uh, with that content. Uh, you can sell it. You can uh, rip it apart. You can print it up. Uh, and you can do a variety of different things on that. And essentially, all content that's, uh, at least in America, uh, uh, released uh, by the end of uh, uh, 24 uh, has lost their copyright and they're effectively open source. Um, there's still some debate about when that's going to be moving forward, depending upon when Disney uh, Disney's resistant to this because they don't want Mickey Mouse to go into public domain because it's still a, a very lucrative um, uh, 
um, opportunity for them. Uh, one of the first licenses that came out there was the GNU licensing, which actually originated from software uh, writing. It was not designed well for dealing with non-software, non-executable code. Uh, but this right here was quite popular 15, 20 years ago. Uh, in fact, Wikipedia first used a, a GNU licensing uh, infrastructure before they switched over to Creative Commons licensing. It currently still exists um, and it still exists in terms of software, but also in terms of the uh, content off of there. It doesn't play very well uh, with Creative Commons licensing in order to remix and such, but they are perfectly valid OER in order to capitalize on. And then Creative Commons has a range of other types of licenses, uh, depending upon the different permissions that you have available. And it's one of the powers of Creative Commons licensing. It's also one of the banes in terms of trying to master Creative Commons licensing. That is the ability in order to force uh, people in order to ascribe authorship, um, or at least attribution in some form for the content that they that you've provided and you've shared, or being able to uh, force people to not make money off of it, or force people to not being able to edit it and such like that. And again, a more descriptive uh, overview of this thing requires more time than what I have available, uh, but understanding uh, the nature of Creative Commons, which is essentially 99, 98% of all OER content out there, and more importantly, the remixing aspect. Uh, that is that you can mix content from different sources, different OER uh, pages, let's say, that have different licenses, but you can only do it in certain manners and you may be forced in order to change the license uh, appropriately off of that. So tracking licenses is essentially important on their site. Every page on our, uh, our LibreText has the ability in order to select a license uh, uh, there. So for example, on this molecular generator li license, I can decide that I want to make this to be CC by SA. I'm not going to do all children and refresh it. And now basically the content on this page is CC by SA. It has an image of the license right there. You can grab it, uh, you can click on it and look at the uh, legalese associated and that's necessary to satisfy the 4.0 requirement uh, for uh, Creative Commons licensing. But you can also switch to a variety of other licenses out here. The key point is that we Graduate, we put a, a graduation, uh, we, lim we tag content uh, on our site at the page level for licensing. That means that you can create a book that each page itself may have a different license. And that's perfectly valid as long as the, how you use that book satisfies all the licenses. So for example, if you have one page that has a non-commercial clause on it, then, and everything else doesn't, you still have to satisfy the non-commercial clause requirements, uh, meaning that you can't sell that book in order to make a profit uh, off of that. So maintaining uh, uh, licensing requirements it, it includes several aspects. And the first aspect is the ability to showcase what the licensing is of your content. Now we've gone through several ways in order to facilitate uh, indicating of these things. Um, <clears throat> so uh, I'm going to skip over the the actual specifics of the Creative Commons licensing. Um, this this slides uh, got, got me over. Um, let me skip. I'm going to skip to this thing because I it's not working so well. If I go to a page and I'm not logged in uh, and I try to copy content from that page, just a Control C. Uh, we've implemented several levels of infrastructure that we largely are folding into an umbrella of no, permissions. Mark. I'm sorry. Do you mean to be screen sharing? Because you're not. Sorry. Okay. No, 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 no. That, that, it's important. <laughs> uh, where, what happened to my page? There, there we go. Thank you, Jennifer. Uh, so we have a, a system that we largely are referring to as uh, permissions modulated editing. Uh, and it's a mechanism in order to try to address the limitations associated with mixing content on a single page. 
Uh, so there's a detailed infrastructure involved in of how you can mix content or was referred to as a compatibility chart between different licensing in order to be able to mix things together. And I don't, it's not important right now in order to talk about the specifics of that. The key point is that you can't arbitrarily grab one page, one content, another content or paragraph here and a paragraph there and combine it together and assume that you are able to do that. Uh, and that's the complexities and the beauties associated with common cartridges. Um, and we are implementing several different processes in order to facilitate that. The first one is a warning system. And it's an early warning system that you may have experienced before you logged in. Um, and actually, for most of you that have the instructor accounts, it's still turned on. And when you have a developer account, it's turned off. Uh, where you basically copy content. I'm going to do a control C here. And then it gives a warning in terms of what the permissions are associated with that content. In this case here, this is a this is an OpenStax Anatomy and Physiology book, which is just CC BY, which is one of the most open licenses available within the common, <clears throat> the Creative Common um, infrastructure, and then it tells you the limitations of what you are able to do. But if you were to switch to a different license uh, out there, uh, and let me find a different uh, content, uh, for example, let's go to nutrition, and we'll go to uh, this book right here. And this right here is based off of a flat world knowledge book that has a different license, a CC by NC share alike. If you can't see that, I'm gonna click on there and you can see it in a bigger aspect. And it has certain limitations associated with that. The key point is that it's a different uh, limitation than the CC by. So if I were to copy this and pay, copy it, it comes up with, uh, uh, first the color code is different. So it's orange or yellow in this case here. Uh, and it basically says you have a CC by NC share alike license. You can use it um, uh, without profit as long as you do these sort of things. So this is meant in, as a mechanism to remind people who are copying and pasting and remixing and editing what you're allowed to do and what you're not allowed to do uh, off of that. <clears throat> then if you were to use some of the more restrictive licenses out there, and I'm gonna switch this over to something more restrictive like CC by ND, And then I'm going to log out so that I don't do that. If I were to copy this thing now with a different license off there, it's now red basically saying you got to be very careful of what you're doing here. This stuff is non-derivative, which means basically you cannot edit or modify that content in any way. Doesn't mean you can't copy it into a page. You just can't modify it in a certain way. And this starts to get into gray areas of legality. Uh, and intrinsically, when you're talking about licenses, you're talking about legal uh, legality and legal interpretations, which are uh, unlike science, unlike what we think science is, can be quite difficult in order to be able to identify what you're allowed to do and not allowed to do. <clears throat> um, so let me mention a few other things. Uh, th what will come around the block, uh, I believe probably at the end of December or early January, is to implement this such that you're not just providing a warning at the copying, when you paste it into a page, it will cross check the license of the content on the page with the license of what you've copied it from and start to tell you whether you can do it, thumbs up, whether you can't do it, thumbs down, or you can do it, but you have to manipulate the overall license on the page. Now, and that gets back to this compatibility chart uh, out there. Uh, and I would like to be able to show that to you, but I'm not at the stage of being able to do that. But this is really powerful. And this is enabled because we have uh, a massive infrastructure. So when you copy and paste from one part of our library to another part of the library, it's intrinsically implemented. A highly fragmented or even a weakly fragmented infrastructure that doesn't have a standard in order to enable this, it essentially means that you don't have the ability to do this. Anyone who gets into constructing of content and OER intrinsically fights against licensing issues at some point or another, typically depending upon how advanced they are in, um, in learning what they're doing. So I think I saw some comments. I'm not sure uh, if they were uh, required addressing at this stage. Looks like not. Okay, so uh, we have this early warning system uh, I'm sure we have this controlled copying system that's going to be implemented uh, very soon. Uh, and then we have this controlled editing that limits uh, whether you can edit pages and such. But what I want to talk about, can I already show the, the early warning system off of here? I want to talk about the Libra lens. Is Carson still here? Because this is a follow up of what he was mentioning. Uh, there he is. Great. I'm still here. Okay. So one of the issues that we have. Um, 
here, uh, is that when you take content from a variety of different sources and you put it onto a page, how do you represent who wrote what and where? Uh, so there's attribution uh, desires in order to put it down at the bottom of the page because we have this con contribution and attribution section that's not on this page because this is a junk page. We have an author bar, uh, which is not indicated here, um, that's typically associated with the author. Like, for example, if I feel that this should be Patrick Fleming, uh, who's a physical chemist uh, in uh, someone, and if I were to re refresh this uh, uh, then he has an author bar here. This is going to be expanded in order to make a distinction between a remixer from an author uh, in order to reflect uh, Carson's concerns. But let's say that you have a page up that has content from three different sources and they're all perfectly fine uh, legality wise. And this, the, 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 uh, the licenses all play very well together. But you want to be able to make a distinction between who did what at one point. This is actually about to be implemented system-wide uh, and basically showing it for the first time right now. So congratulations, or I'm sorry. Uh, <clears throat> and this page here, if we implement what we call a Libra lens, uh, and the Libra lens, uh, when you toggle, toggle it, it's also on the tools section, um, it then shows you uh, the content where uh, content was copied from, as long as it's copied from our site. For example, we have three different sources of uh, material. Uh, and they're highlighted by either purple, whatever you call it, red and, and light pink. Uh, if you were to cycle this again, uh, it changes to a different color because that's a random thing that we have on here. Uh, <clears throat> and it says that all the stuff that's in purple came from uh, uh, chemistry page 28311. Everything that's green came from chemistry 189527 and chemistry page 016711. So that doesn't mean much to you. Uh, but we can click on this page. Does this work? Okay, this should be a link that, okay, here. If you go to here and you highlight over it, it gives you the, uh, the page uh, that we're having. Let me go over here. The page where this is copied from, the author of the page where it's copying from, the license of the page that I was copied from, uh, and even the, the number off of here. So it provides a mechanism in order to slice and dice, or more specifically, not slice and dice, but present all the different contributions that go to the page in order to be able to do uh, fine level remixing, and more importantly, addressing the attribution requirements that we legally have to do under most of our openly licensed material. Um, and this provides a mechanism in addition to being able to have the warning system and the controlled system in order to facilitate full compliance and full legal uh, necessity in order to be able to remix content effectively. And it's enabled only because we have control over where content it comes from and where content is pasted because we have a massive infrastructure in order to facilitate that. We're very excited about this uh, and uh, its capabilities I think are really great in order to be able to track content and how it's distributed. So if you write a paragraph somewhere, uh, you can then find out who else used that paragraph on a different page. And you can start to get a better idea of the networking of how things are bouncing together and your contributions reused across the libraries, uh, not just on one library, but across the whole platform. Uh, and I'm very excited about this, uh, if that's not obvious from you uh, from, from here. I think it's great. Uh, and there is nothing even remotely close to this uh, uh, out there. So um, let me uh, end on a few uh, topics. Uh, the we're building. I can switch to here. We're building uh, this massive uh, LibreVist ecosystem of various components. <clears throat> uh, it, this took a lot of resources in order to build. Uh, we've received to date somewhere in the order of about seven to seven and a half million dollars uh, from a variety of different sources, primarily federal government, uh, although the state of California contributed to, to that. Um, and it's being constructed. Uh, we're very excited with where it's going. Uh, hopefully you share our enthusiasm, uh, but it's important in order to sustain it. Um, so we don't want this effort to dissipate. Uh, there's no concern that our libraries would disappear in content because we are constantly being asked in order to share our libraries with various other uh, projects in order to be able to capitalize on what we are doing so that they can actually move forward. That's not a concern of that. It's the overall integrity of everything that we're concerned about. So we need to have a viable sustainability model in order to move forward. This gets back into this money aspect I talked about before because sustainability means money. 
I don't call it a business model because we're not trying to make a profit. We all have day jobs in, in what we're doing here, but we want to be able to maintain uh, this integrity as it moves forward. So let me skip over that. In order to do that, uh, there are several different mechanisms for sustainability. So one is governmental support. You know, we've received funding from the state of, of from NSF, the Department of Education, uh, from uh, the, the Learning Lab. Uh, that is an effective starting point, but these are agencies that are not in the business of long-term support of any project, irrespective of the benefits of that project uh, for um, the educational mission uh, of things. We can charge student access of that. We are very much resistant to doing that because we don't believe that we want students in order to have any money that they need to pay out uh, in order to maintain this because uh, the whole point of the project is to make that barrier zero so that there's no resistance if or between students accessing the content that they need in order to maximize their performance in their class. So that means that we have to push sustainability into the institutional level. Uh, uh, and that <coughs> can be done uh, with uh, a variety of different mechanisms. Uh, so far, we've received a sizable support from the Affordable Learning Solutions uh, from the Cal State University System uh, and from uh, UC Davis. Uh, and this is essentially the starting point uh, of our LibreNet. And the LibreNet Consortium is still in, the, in infancy, but you'll be hearing a lot more about that in the upcoming year, which is a mechanism in order to maintain uh, our project, move it forward, where we're asking campuses uh, that if they, uh, if they support the project to buy into the project um, uh, as needed. The going co cost right now is just $500 a, a year um, and it provides some additional features. So one of the key components of that is that we limit the number of uh, remixes that a specific campus can host to five uh, before being able to uh, be forced to be a member of the LiberNet at $500. That's basically nothing uh, for most campuses. Uh, uh, and it's meant in order to uh, work at scale, not trying to build any individual campus uh, for the source off of that. It comes with other benefits off of that. Uh, and this is just one of them that's coming out uh, very soon, which is campus specific portals. And so we have the opportunity for campuses that uh, buy into that, that we can actually build an infrastructure so that it's a single a point of contact with the textbooks that are available for that. And that provides, uh, it's better to show that uh, in action here. Um, and I may have, I, I think I killed it, so I will pull it up again. Um, and again, this is similar to the sort of portals that other projects uh, provide uh, for their uh, consortium members like OER Commons, which has a, has a portal infrastructure. Lumen basically charges the same thing, um, but we're not trying to maximize profit. So this right here is a portal I, uh, that's set up. It's still beta. I'm going to select all libraries uh, and uh, select, for example, College of the Canyons. Uh, this will be hardwired into their portal uh, and provide an opportunity for their students and their faculty to know the various courses that they have available on their campus. You can click on it and then you have the availability of looking at or mechanism to view the online, the PDFs, even be able to uh, buy the print version of that, which goes directly to this. And then a student can come in and say, yes, I want to buy this and I'm ready to go. Uh, off of that. Uh, and it's an independent mechanism in order to provide the most up-to-date version of a book uh, because it grabs the most up-to-date version when it pushes it to the printer in order to be able to process that. Um, there are a handful of other components associated with uh, being a member of the LibreNet. Um, I don't want to discuss it uh, too much right now or actually at all because uh, time is limited and it's been a long day. Uh, so I just want to end uh, with the general overview of the LibreNet Consortium, which you'll be hearing more about uh, as, we, um, uh, as we move forward. And that's the sustainability model in order to be able to do that. So with that, I thank everyone who stuck around to the very end of this meeting.